Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center. My name is Quentin Ring, and I am Beyond Baroque's executive director. Uh, and welcome, welcome back to many of you. Uh, some of you I think I see quite regularly here since we reopened in March, but uh, a few faces I haven't seen uh, since before the pandemic. So it's really a pleasure to be able to welcome you back to Beyond Baroque, as well as to welcome a few uh, new folks, uh, the folks that are new to this space. Um, I am incredibly honored uh, to be welcoming you also to a reading tonight with uh, one of Los Angeles' favorite literary couples, Lou Matthews and Allison Turner, uh, two really, tru truly wonderful writers. Um, we also have Suzanne Lummis here, uh, Los Angeles' noir poet laureate, to introduce both of them, a longtime friend of Beyond Baroque. We'll get to the program in just a moment, uh, but first I did want to say a few words about Beyond Baroque. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their land. And as an arts organization, we are committed to uplifting indigenous writers and communities. Um, to tell you a little bit more about Beyond Baroque, um, we were founded in 1968 uh, and we're housed here in the original Venice City Hall. Uh, we are a nonprofit public space dedicated to cultivating new writing, building a diverse literary community, expanding the public's knowledge of poetry, fiction, literature, and art uh, through cultural events and community interactions. That means we have a really wide variety of literary arts programming. We have workshops, uh, Monday night fiction workshop uh, every week that's free, it's on Zoom. Uh, we have the Wednesday night poetry workshop, which has been running continuously since 1969. That's also on Zoom. A variety of paid workshops as well, um, and we have a great we have a great series of readings and performances every night, uh, every weekend here in this theater. Um, just to give you a little taste of what we have coming up tomorrow, we have the book launch for James Spooner's graphic memoir High Desert. Uh, James is the director of the documentary Afro Punk, um, and so we'll be having both a conversation with him uh, tomorrow. There'll be a zine fest in the back. There'll be some punk bands playing. It'll be a lot of fun. I hope you come back for that. Um, we have Gabrielle Seville performing next Saturday. She's a performance artist and poet, uh, incredibly talented performer. Really excited about having her join us. Um, and we have a great deal more coming up as well. So please check out our website, beyondbaroque.org for the full calendar of events. Um, in order to continue the work that we do, we, uh, we really do uh, need the support of our community. So if you're not a member of Beyond Baroque, please do consider becoming a member. It's as little as $50 for an individual. Seventy-five dollars to get your dual membership. It helps us keep these events for free for now. As we reopen, we may have to charge later. We'll see how funding goes, etc. But even if you, even if we do have to charge in the future as a member, you will be able to get into all of our events for free. Um, so please do see Jimmy in the bookstore about that after the show. Um, beyond supporting Beyond Baroque, I also just really need to plug um, both Lou and Allison's books. Um, we have them both in the bookstore. Uh, they're really wonderful. This is Allison's book. This is the second split between and Lou's Shaky Town. Um, I'm very excited about both of them. I hope you are too. I think you're going to hear a lot you like in the reading this evening. Um, and so let's just go ahead and get to that reading uh, after all the preamble. Um, I'm not going to say too much more about Lou and Allison. I love them both. We had them here back in 2017. It was an incredible event. I've been wanting to have them back ever since. There's been like a pandemic or something like that in the interim. So it's taken a while. But we're here now, um, and to introduce them, we have Suzanne Lummis, herself an amazing poet, a great friend of Beyond Baroque, the editor of our Pacific Coast Poetry Series, and a wonderful uh, introducer of events. Please welcome Suzanne Lummis. I haven't even done anything yet. I'm getting an applause. Okay, this is where I, apparently I get to take off my mask. Is my lipstick all smeared all over the place? It's either smeared or probably vanished. And uh, that's my only complaint about wearing a mask is my vanity. Um, all right, I wanna say, uh, so Quentin wisely and appropriately said something about great literary couples. And I just wanted to reinforce what he said. We so, if people knew how badly Hollywood needs more literary couples right now, I mean, when I think of the great ones, I think of uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and uh, Simone de Beauvoir, but 
that was a long time ago and that was over there in France you know and then there was well famously uh Allen Ginsberg and Peter Olamsky but they were up in San Francisco and, and that was long ago and so happily we have with us here in LA Allison Turner and and uh Lou Matthews um and I was just having a conversation with Allison, I think, before Lou, you were off. I think Lou was off writing his next novel. And I was talking to Allison and talking about how interesting, though, to have two writers living in the same house, but in different modes of writing. The poet who draws often from the interior life the interior world, but then also is an observer, an acute and sensitive observer of all the elements of the external world, the sounds, the visuals, the life. And then you have your fiction writer who invents environments and characters based on his own or her own, which is sometimes also the case, experience of the world. I'm going to read a little section of Allison's work and a little section of Lou's work uh, before that two little sections I fell in love with, not the only sections I'm in love. I'm in love with all the sections of all their work, but I chose two. And um, but also I wanted to say something about Oh, here it is. Yeah, I wanted to just reinforce and remind you of a couple of elements of their bios, which you had uh, many opportunities to see online and elsewhere and in the Beyond Broke program. But just so that it's really fresh in your minds right now, uh, Alison Turner's debut collection, with The Split Between, this has, I'm going to change this right here because it's the passive tense, was selected by. So I'm going to change it to the active tense. Do, do you think that would be a good idea? Okay, Dorian Locke selected Alison Turner's debut collection, The Split Between, and her poems have appeared in the American Poetry Journal, that's a good one. Mid-Atlantic Review, the Hudson Review, I've been in that. Oh, San Pedro River Review, I've been in that, that's a good one. Okay, bunch of other ones. If they're, if I've been in them, they're the good ones, okay. And then um, Lou has written, oh my God, he's written seven, such a lucky number of books that he has written and published three of them, which is a really good percentage, three out of seven. <laughs> And all he needs to do now is publish half of a novel and he'll have published half of all the books that he's written. So his books are Shaky Town, Just Like James and L.A. Breakdown, which was an L.A. Times best book. Yay, L.A. Times. We support the L.A. Times because we support newspapers. And he, and here's, now we get to the really important part, like me, he teaches in the UCLA Extension Writers Program. And there are quite a few people among you out there in the audience who have studied in the UCLA Extension Writers Program. And uh, they generally tend to be trustworthy people, so you can get to know them. Okay, so I'm now going to read, Allison is going to come up to read first, and then Lou Matthews is going to read. And I'm going to first read a section of Allison's sequence poem about, and her book, her published book, is about the pandemic in that it's poems that she was able to create out of her observation and experiences, even while being shut in. So this is from the COVID notebooks and it appeared in the late great American Journal of Poetry, which was an online journal, a very good resource, by the way, if you want to find lots and lots of poems, the American Journal of Poetry. All right, this is the second sequence. The wings of a dove sound on takeoff like the whimper of a small goat this first morning 
sticky fingered bindweed feels its way over the neighbor's fence. Blue blossoms pried open by the sun. Under threat, the ordinariness of our day seems different. The narrow streets of our neighborhood empty as if no one plans to get up. My husband heard geese last night, one honking overhead, another calling back. The geese not used to flying in such a dark, sounding it out to find each other. I can already tell where this is going. A sense that as the days begin to pass, we is the place we live. And then from Lou's short fiction piece that appeared in that noir journal magazine that was kind of very cool looking that produced several great noir magazines issues. And this uh, is from one of his short fictions uh, called Hollywood Itis. The speaker is in a bar describing a bar called Boulders, and the speaker is a television writer. And he doesn't call himself a failed television writer because he feels television writers are not honorable enough to be called failed, only the poets are. So he calls himself faded. Uh, and this is, I have a, this is, they're all good paragraphs. I recommend all of them, but I'll do this one. <clears throat> Talking about the bar. The daytime is different. The back bar does glow and the liqueurs on the top shelf do look like jewels. But when the back door is open, the shocking white light blasts in on the shrinking mole people. The dust motes hang in that white light. And you see once again the grubby astroturf and molded white plastic chairs of what boulders insists is a patio. There is a dead ficus tree in a clay pot there. Some broken mission style roof tiles. That doesn't make it a patio. No Spanish colonial emphasis will make it so. Bad set design. In the Guatemalan jungle, which I once visited for the filming of Carnosar, the ficus trees reached 80 feet and were known as the Palo de Mata, tree of death or strangler fig. Twinning parasites. They enwrap and consume their host, much like producers and directors and actors, as they absorb and digest an original story and make it their own. Not that we are bitter. Palo de Mata, that was south of Tikal, the one. Maya site that everyone knows. The rebel base in Star Wars, and don't ask me which one in the sequence. Let's just say the only good one, the first one. The rebel base, two pyramids popping out of the jungle. Guys in segmented plastic armor on top of the pyramids with spears. What's that about? Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks to all of you. I can't see you because there are these lights in my eyes, but it I can feel you in three dimension out there, and it's wonderful. Um, I'm going to start with the with two poems. 
Uh, the first is the opening poem of the book, and the second is the closing one. They're the frame of the collection, and perhaps you'll realize as I go on why they are. The first poem, Homo Sapiens. They know now that it was not an avalanche. He died of his wounds after realizing he was dying. After then neatly stacking his tools and other possessions against the rock face and placing himself nearby. First, he had helped a companion away from the fighting. It was a companion's blood on his jacket, not his own. And a companion must have pulled the arrow from his shoulder blade. His own arrows were very light, almost delicate. From that, they know he preferred to hunt above the tree line. And he respected his tools, as though they were not the work of his own hands, as though they were a gift. He had been trying to fashion a makeshift arrow out of two that had broken. Then he realized he was dying and stacked his tools and the broken arrows against the rock face. They do not know if there was a lull in the fighting or what happened to his companion. The ice continues to retreat. 5,000 years have passed. No one said it would be easy. Horses standing blindfolded in the surf, dogs sprinting into traffic. At the bottom of a dry swimming pool, a man wrapped in a wet sheet, an operator's voice saying, don't hang up. TV, bottom, fire, the smell of air burned through, the peculiar hush ash shares with snow. Cedar, Witch Creek, Marble Cone, sand, the one seed pried open by heat, the one hour or day of pure consequence. What would you save to prove you had a life? This week has been full of horrific news of fatal shootings, a supermarket, a flea market, Grand Central Market downtown, a church in Orange County, a Chicago Park, a high school graduation, this other epidemic, guns. I have a few poems that speak to that. Stray bullet. Meaning, it didn't mean to. Meaning, there was a hole in the air. Meaning, it was lost before it knew what was happening. From the car, Hector's son going down on the corner of Gower and Fountain sees very carefully the place he will die, only a few blocks from Paramount Studios. Hector's son cannot imagine death, the world right here, between the sound of the gun and the no sound of blood hitting the sidewalk. Hector's son, re-murdered, me on the way to work, or on the way home, this same intersection, phone book cut from the chain, Audi on my tail, driver thinking girl, thinking flowers. Dark matter. More than 285,000 students have experienced gun violence at school since Columbine. Washington Post, December 31, 2021. The children huddle together in the corner. They hold their breaths. Fear seeps like ground fog along the classroom floor between chair legs, the sour milk smell of it. The steps in the hall stop before the barricaded door, then continue on. What I am telling you is not something that happened to me, but it is something, some form of matter that has passed lightless into my body. It is stored there like a tribal story. We are reluctant to tell each other now that the future has been broken into and so much is missing. The central axis of our lives here runs between Hollywood, south and east to the desert, the Mojave, 
also known as the high desert, the Colorado, the rift that is the Coachella Valley. Here's a couple of Hollywood poems. Earthquake Hollywood. In the rubble of Serrano Avenue, they think again of Yerevan, the groans and whispers from under the street, red coffins, the air smelling of burlap and cellar dirt. Remember Mexico City, the giant skeleton on display, a tiny family around the table eating dinner between his ribs? All that waiting, all that wanting to be unharmed. There was and there was not the old Armenian say, beginning every story. Cycles. A thunderstorm forms over the Hollywood sign, a ready-made bruise waiting for the right hand. Jesus tells me blood is green and only turns red when exposed to air. Then he tells his son and his son's son about the color of bruises after the wind has slapped the house around all night and the house, dazed in morning light, pulls it all together. This is a day of red flag warnings backfires lit in the canyon, then rain. If this were a movie about life in India, rain would mean sex, but it's not. The rain pours down, the fires suck it up and sizzle out. On Hollywood Boulevard, Superman takes shelter and puts on his glasses. Coachella. When at night bats fly too close to the wind farm, the air is sucked from their lungs and they drop. In the morning, a man collects their bodies, thinking big wind, small consequence, or not thinking, or not small, the split second between hunger and nothing when the switch is thrown and lights begin to burn all the way to the coast. In your dream, you are the blade, the bat, the night, the burn, the man, the coast, the switch. And when you awake, the seconds split between. Upon being asked on a bad day to save the Salton Sea. Under the chocolate mountains, cars rust on blocks beside the double wides, each on its own cement slab. Beached arsenic in old sea dust lies ready to blow. Heat flattens the weak light, traps the dead egg stink of the trapped sea. Mistaken birds walk out on the salt once or twice before dying. What one beautiful thing has ever happened here? What days here have ever added up to enough? God never said to me, as he said to Moses, I will be your mouth. Seasonal shift, Morongo Basin. That day, dry clouds ferried dry lightning north from Mexico. On the graveled mountains sprung pods, sparse grasses, the broken lobes of cactus. Where the runoff found its many paths, molten tributaries turned a brilliant bleed, the wind itself fire. When the desert burns, unhealed wounds are laid open and it's easy to hate. That day, even the dead went away. The moments in between went away. Enough went away. One by one, the lights along the highway blinked out. We didn't see coming what happened next. It did not heat up. Instead, it began to rain. I'm gonna conclude with a longer poem from the COVID notebooks that you were part of, thanks to Suzanne's wonderful reading. I had thought a month ago that COVID would be such old news, this poem would seem dated, but not quite happened that way. I wrote it the first few months of the lockdown. It's a sequence of poems, sometimes just notes, sometimes fragments, something like a whole poem. 
I pause between the fragments to let you hear the silence. Um, you may remember in the early days of the lockdown when the white noise of freeways disappeared and traffic sounds were gone, the palpable presence of silence. Uh, that's the white on the page. That's my pause. It's part of the poem. A man leaves his tent and steps off the curb, shouting and waving his arms as if fighting a coal that enshrouds him like a spider's trap, as if the maneuvering cars exiting the freeway off-ramp were just a swift current that would sweep him clear of old orbits and give him a chance to live. These days, there is much to fear. The expert called upon to address our national health tells us to stay put the way my mother did when she went to open the door for a stranger. At least we have a door, says my husband, slipping out of the life he's been living all this time. The wings of a dove sound on takeoff like the whimper of a small goat this first morning. Sticky fingered bindweed feels its way over the neighbor's fence, blue blossoms pried open by the sun. Under threat, the ordinariness of our day seems different. The narrow streets of our neighborhood empty as if no one plans to get up. My husband heard geese last night, one honking overhead, another calling back. The geese not used to flying in such a dark, sounding it out to find each other. I can already tell where this is going. A sense that as days begin to pass, we is the place we live. 9 p.m., a street that is used to praising the dead now dumbstruck in the rinsed glamor of an empty still lit ballroom. Hollywood Boulevard as pure aftermath. At a going away party last month, or was it? That young cop who was somebody's brother told of a man on his beat coming every night to sleep on his favorite star in front of Grauman's Chinese theater. Before he curled up, he always removed his shoes. I miss brief conversations with strangers. Cheerful today as a make-believe Christmas tree that can be untinseled and put away all gesture toward an occasion, all show, no tell, as if, but not. As if something could be done, we zoom the screen with fulsome greetings, lean in to speak as if unestranged in our separate space capsules orbiting what's left of Earth. In a show of hands, who wants what? There's no point in watching the clock. What we saw when we saw that movie, flagellants like goats crawling on elbows in the dust, the racket of expurgation, sour messengers of death gorged on back blood or hitching a ride in the scruffy coat of a loyal dog. They worried us and the night's white gaze like snowfall from a foreign sky worried us. The risk of turning inland into a birdless forest our little funerals of the mind. Any line of this could be the last. In defeated silence, like passengers on a bus, sometimes we sit or sometimes we do something. Bake apples, clean the oven. My husband is the real person in my life. As the day progresses, we fall in and out of step. Our whole world is not lost, yet we cannot say we will want to say years later we were here. That strange watery noise is leftover rain dripping from the bird of paradise. No set change needed. We go on as before. Come out, come out, wherever you are. In hindsight, I will know my distractions were a reason to live. What's missing is speed, no split second to force a choice, no particular before, after, 
all roads lead to where we are and stop. Why then in my mind's eye do I keep seeing her sister, the nun, wimple in place, hiking up her long black skirt in the surf and splashing her plump bare feet, kicking the little wavelets before they change their minds and head out again to sea. My husband told me he dreamed he was following a huge snake in Montana. It's lethargic waving motions through dust and drying grass going somewhere the way he was not. And just as I thought my dream had grown bored and left, it was back, dream grass, an occasional dream shrub, the very small whistle of a very small bird nearby, the upswept whistle of a flycatcher, two doves picking their way across a balcony as if walking barefoot across a pebbled beach. My husband's uncle is a priest when we meet on Zoom, we ask him to suggest to God that enough is enough. No can do, he says. I'm in sales, not management. <laughs> when night arrives, I walk right in. The sky is birdless until the crows arrive, greeting each other on wide crow paths, hundreds winging in the same direction towards the old canyon quarry, Every day, not at the same time, but at the same light, the turning away from day and heading toward dusk light that is resistant almost successfully to dark. You have to wonder about crows, what exactly they have in mind. The crows who live on my street know me by sight. At this very moment, they are deciding when and where, so finely tuned is their ambition. The incredible panic of Wednesday, an old lady's food run at dawn, masked and gloved, life's sacrifice for frozen waffles and Gatorade. Our little market is perfectly dangerous, or I am. You're breaking up, we said to each other in last night's Zoom room. Well, so much for the self. I see myself as my husband sees me in the same mirror to not be separate from what I see, to wake pleased and unthinking. Every evening promptly at eight, our neighbors emerge and howl, their howls ricocheting off the canyon walls. Every evening is its own little purgatory, nothing for it but to wait as if every this or that were another Beckett play. It's as if I've been sent to my room by the mayor. I can tell you, thought won't improve my behavior. Tonight, the mayor wept on TV. What now? If I knew the answer to that, I would know the meaning of life. It can't be laundry, or maybe it is. That sound you think you heard was the wind quick on its feet. It cuts and runs. Meanwhile, it's always meanwhile. We sink into our backstories, sweeping the kitchen floor, remaking the bed, one habit after another. They say if life resumes, it won't be for everyone. We won't go to the poles anymore. We won't see the angel stationed in the tree. We won't know what's missing. Spooked child, I believed moths were ghosts, newly dead, the swarm of them tapping the window, wanting my attention, wanting my light. Della, in her Irish mood, told me moths were the ghosts of angels fallen from heaven with no way back. See what can happen, she said, wrapping my skull with her swollen knuckles. Now, no moths, no angels, no heaven. Only a world winding down, all of its people on the inside looking out. So what happened next surprised us. A single moth after all these years materialized against the window, wings flattened, pale as the underside of some unborn thing, still in its own world, but pressing against ours. 
I want it to mean something. Thank you. I want to have Suzanne read all my work. It's a lot funnier when she does it. One correction, um, the title of the story she was talking about, which is also the title of my next book, is Hollywoodski. A um, couple thank yous. Quentin, executive director here, Jimmy Vega, and Yvonne Salinas, who coordinated this event tonight. And uh, it's wonderful to be back at Beyond Baroque. I also have a couple of other thank yous. One is for Jim Gavin, um, who basically made Shaky Town my book possible. Shaky Town is a novel about place. It's like Winesburg, Ohio, or Cannery Row, or Gloria Naylor's Women of Brewster Place. It's about people who live and work there. Shaky Town got its name from the earthquake fault that runs underneath the most active fault in California which has done one good thing. It has kept property values down and poor people still live on the hills. I'm gonna be reading tonight from a section that takes place in the 1980s. And uh, it's about Brother Cyril, who's the Dean of Discipline at St. Patrick's, who has been investigating his predecessor at the school, a Father Galvin, who may have molested students. Um, I'm indebted to Paul Mandelbaum um, for his opinion about a year ago uh, when he was talking about what he liked in the book. And uh, he picked this section and uh, it's usually, it's the first time I've ever read it because it's too long for anything east of La Brea, but we're in Venice now. So this takes a little under a half an hour. Jesus was a carpenter. Brother Cyril sat down in one of the deep armchairs facing the fireplace and picked up the copy of the tidings left open on the common room side table. As nearly as always was nearly always the case, the previous reader had left it open to the announcements page, that section of the Archdiocesan newspaper devoted to the comings and goings of the clergy. The newly ordained were, were listed there, as were the newly departed. Cyril always thought it tactful that the death announcements received the same size headlines as the appointments, both in the church's eyes being a form of promotion. As he scanned toward the bottom of the page, a one column headline jumped up and bit him. New pastor named at St. Anselm's. St. Anselm's had been Father Galvin's parish. There was no mention of Galvin, only the new parish pastor, a Father McNulty. Cyril scoured the rest of the page and then the rest of the paper. There was no mention of Father Michael Galvin anywhere in the tidings. Galvin had been Cyril's predecessor as Dean of Discipline at St. Patrick's. Cyril had learned that Brother Malachi, the school's principal, requested the bishop to move Galvin along and later he'd learned the reason. Galvin had, met, had molested altar boys at a previous parish and there was a possibility he may have crossed some lines with students at St. Patrick's. Nothing had been proven, but it was Cyril's view that no one had pursued the matter much either. Now the man had unofficially disappeared. No headlines, no news. Cyril thought of asking Malachi what he'd heard, but decided to save that. Cyril looked up the number of St. Anselm's and asked to speak to Father McNulty. When McNulty answered the housekeeper's summons, Cyril inquired about his, after his old friend and classmate, Father Galvin. There was a long pause and then Father McNulty asked, who is this again? He sounded elderly. Brother Cyril at St. Patrick's High School. And McNulty, clearly with pen in hand, asked for the spelling of his name and then asked, and how is it again that you know Galvin? Cyril dearly noted that Father Galvin had become Galvin which meant he had left the church. Father McNulty went on to say that he did not know Galvin personally, had never met the man, 
knew nothing of his circumstances, had himself just arrived, drafted from his parish in Stockton on short notice, following his vows of obedience. McNulty's voice was like a wave breaking on those words, vows of obedience. Then he asked for Cyril's phone number and said he would pass the inquiry along to the bishop as he was doing with all inquiries regarding Galvin. So there had been others. Cyril followed the natural line of inquiry. He called up the tidings. The reporter there, a Mr. Freeze, was even less helpful than Father McNulty. The bishop was again invoked and then legal precedent. This is a general policy, Mr. Freeze said. He sounded as though he were reading from the boilerplate text on personnel matters. Because of legal liabilities and to protect the privacy rights of archdiocesan employees, we cannot provide any information as to the status or whereabouts. There was a pause and Cyril realized Mr. Freeze also would not say Father Galvin. The whereabouts of the man you ask about. Then he's left the church, Cyril asked. Mr. Freeze hung up. The next policy statement came from Brother Malachi who asked Cyril to refrain from further inquiries. I can tell you, Malachi said, that Michael Galvin has left the priesthood, but that is as much as I know. And then Malachi made an unexpected appeal to Cyril's better nature. He asked that Cyril wait, hold off just a few months on his inquiries until the final construction work of the new school chapel had been completed and the bishop had come to consecrate the chapel and say the first mass there. They were walking on the school's oval track when Malachi, Malachi made this appeal. The football team was practicing on the green inside the oval. Neither of them paid attention because neither understood the game. Cyril began to understand the weight that Malachi carried and how much the chapel meant to him. This is unprecedented, Malachi said. It's the first time the Cardinal has paid for a high school chapel. It will be the first time that the bishop has ever come to consecrate a chapel in the archdiocese. We are being favored. It may very well be because we helped with Father Gallon. But think what it will mean to the school. The Cardinal himself bought the altar, an altarpiece, all in Carrera marble. Cyril snorted, from the dis discretionary fund, no doubt. Don't disturb them, Malachi pleaded. Cyril decided he would not trouble Brother Malachi further. His next winter round of inquiries would be Severosa. He called Captain Costello at the Highland Park Police Station. Cyril had worked closely with Captain Costello the previous spring to avert what could have been a disastrous gang fight between St. Patrick's and the local public high school, Hamilton High. The gang fight had been prevented, but in the aftermath, one St. Patrick's student had been wounded and his brother killed in a drive-by shooting. Cyril had found Captain Costello to be a true ally in that difficult time, and they'd grown even closer in the months since. Captain Costello was a devout but practical, practical Catholic. They met at the monthly Knights of Columbus meeting at St. Vincent's at Eagle Rock, an excellent cover for them both. It was Captain Costello's home parish, and Cyril was an honored guest come to recruit the KFC sons to St. Patrick's. In the bar afterwards, Cyril explained, I'm in a pickle, he said. My predecessor as Dean of Discipline, a Father Galvin, may have sexually abused some students. Captain Costello stirred his scotch with a finger. I met the man once. I remember him as enthusiastic. I'm trying to track him down, down Cyril said. The man is bunked. I'm getting no cooperation from the archdiocese. What I had hoped was that you could trace him. Would you say there was an active lack of cooperation on the part of the archdiocese, Costello asked. I would, Cyril said. It's not that they don't care, just the opposite. Last known I address, St. Anselm's in Altadena. The new pastor claims to know nothing. Let me make a few calls, Costello said. I'll get back to you when I know something. In anger, Cyril had observed, Brother Malachi responded almost like a thermometer. A band of red, first visible at the base of his neck, would ascend until his forehead turned crimson 
and a vain throb. When the excitement was more pleasant, Malachi grew pink. His freckles faded, his ears turned rosy, and eventually his face nearly matched his reddish hair. Today he was pink. The marble altarpiece for the chapel had arrived, seven heavy crates from Carrara in Italy. The two workmen who accompanied the crates, Gerd and Joaquin Miller, were local artisans, but their approach and attitude was, was definitely European. As Malachi excitedly told Cyril, their diamond-edged tools were Swiss, and even their cloth tape measures were metric. The original plans for the chapel called for wood, a good quality walnut for the altar table, walnut, burl, veneer for the fascia, and cabinetry with the, that would enclose the tabernacle. No saintly relics had been included in the budget. The relic, usually a tooth or the hair or bones of a saint, would be wrapped in lead foil and cemented in place beneath the altar stone during the consecration. Relics of martyrs were preferred, but cost extra, and St. Patrick's could not afford even a more modest saint. Then the cardinal had intervened, providing the five-piece altar slab and four-piece tabernacle enclosure, and also a holy relic, the authenticated hair and finger bone of St. Basila, both virgin and martyr. The relics with their, with their Vatican certificates of authenticity would remain with the Archdiocesan office until the Pratt Chapel's consecration. Malachi hovered over the Miller brothers all week, beginning with the hoisting of the cranes to the sixth floor. The largest was eight feet by three and weighed 400 pounds. He oversaw their unpacking, the placement of the carved beveled marble slabs on the beds of wet concrete prowled onto the wooden forms that the Miller brothers had spent the last month constructing to the measurements fur furnished by the marble works. Everything fit. All was square and level and in line. Plum, as the Miller brothers delighted in showing Malachi. The tabernacle was enclosed. All that remained was the final polish and the placement and cementing of the altar stone above St. Basila, St. Basila's bone and hair. Malachi exulted at the craft demonstrated in their marble. Imagine, man, just imagine, this was made by workmen whose forefathers quarried blocks for Michelangelo. Even with the dust and the lack of polish, Cyril was impressed by the stone and the craftsmanship. The altar table looked nearly seamless, and clearly the five pieces had been cut whole from the same slab, then separated. The delicate green black veins continued across the joints. The tabernacle housing was the same with matched veins, and Cyril realized that the cutout section of the altar table had been sliced into quarters, identical palette panels, beautifully book matched. The only carving was on the face of the altar table, and it was light and delicate, more like engraving than carving, a scrolled filigree with hollowed scallop shells at each corner. It was the thoughtful and beautiful, it was thoughtful and beautiful craftsmanship. And even if Cyril couldn't truly appreciate its quality, he could sense it watching the solemnity and reverence with which the Miller brothers approached the stone. Both Gerd and Joachim would pause in their labors, stand back and side along the stone and run a hand along the surface as though they were struck stroking the fur of some fabulous beast. The call came from Captain Costello and the gravity in his voice alerted Cyril. Not good news, Costello said, and you need to understand before we go any further that this could hurt you personally. The Cardinal is, crack is cranking up the drawbridge and boiling the oil. He suggested they meet at the Tamashander on Las Feliz, a restaurant and bar well away from their normal haunts. I don't think we'll run into anyone, Costello said, but I don't plan to wear my uniform and I don't think you should either. Cyril, uncomfortable out of uniform, parked on Las Feliz and walked back to the restaurant. Slack seemed incredibly confining after a cassock and he had to resist the impulse to pull down on the crotch. The Tam Shannon, a mock Highlands Inn built in the 1920s, looked like a set from Brigadoon. A squat round tower 
top the low whitewashed building with a conical roof of fake thatch shaped like a witch's hat. The front and side simulated half timbered construction with aged looking wooden beams protruding from the plaster. A red many windowed British telephone booth stood near the portico. Inside, the main room was filled with flags and tartans and heraldry. There were three fireplaces visible with simulated flames and taped crackle. crackle. The waitresses all wore kilts and the bartender had mutton chops, sideburns and garters on his puffy white sleeves. Captain Costello was ensconced in the snug, a small booth at the end of the bar. He stood up as Sarah was escorted to him by the tartan hostess. Mr. Cleary, he said. Cyril had asked for Mr. Costello. As they sat, a waitress immediately brought two drams of scotch, neat, and set them before Cyril. You'll like that, Costello said, the famous Macallan, a single malt. Did you find Father Galvin? Cyril asked. It's a long and winding tale, Costello said. We found him. He's in Ireland, no longer a priest. How he got there was a little, it is a little convoluted. Cyril had his first sip and asked the waitress to bring him water. When she left, Costello continued. I started with a simple skip trace, Galvin's last address. That was flagged by the boys in Vice and then the DA's office. He was on both their, their wish lists. That's where I got most of my information. Galvin was in Stockton and Tulare and in Selmo, and he got pushed out at each parish for touchy-feely with the altar boys. They knew they had a problem, but they kept moving him around. Finally, they bring him to Los Angeles, to St. Patrick's, where he is also undergoing a course of therapy. Cyril nodded. That was my understanding, corrective counseling, treatment for alcoholism. Cyril sipped again and chased it with water. Did it work? Costello asked. May have restrained him a bit, Cyril said. As far as we know, he did not molest any of the other boys in any in any of the boys in any usual sense. He had some of them undressed for, cor for corporal punishment. Costello gave him a long look. Bare ass caning? You're right. That's not the usual sense. Cyril flushed. I'm sorry, he said. I'm parroting my principal's phraseology on the matter. This all took place the year before I took the job at St. Patrick's. I was appalled when I found out. Your principal, Brother Malachi, Costello said. So Brother Malachi calls up the bishop. They move him out, move him along to St. Anselm's, and things simmer, simmer down for about two years. Then all hell breaks loose. Galvin recrosses the line. Only this time, it's the housekeeper's daughter, 14 years old, Sylvia Molina by name, and she's pregnant. Then he really goes off the rails, tries to talk the kid into an abortion, starts dipping into the collection basket to pay for it. Sylvia freaks. I mean, the kid's a devout Catholic. Why else would she be fucking a 50-year-old priest? She thinks maybe God can forgive her for sins of the flesh, but not for killing a baby. She finally talks to her mother, Inez, and Inez, who is even more devout than her daughter, decides the only thing to be done is to move up the chain of the heavenly chain of command. She never even thinks of calling the cops. She calls up the, the former pastor at St. Anselm's, who is now a Monsignor and working downtown. Within the month, Sylvia is living at St. Bridget's, a private facility for wayward girls, known for its good soup, kind nuns, round-the-clock medical care, and counseling. Inez continues as housekeeper at St. Anselm's, but she now commutes from her new house in Whittier, and her husband, Pedro, has 12 landscaping contracts for churches in the San Gabriel Valley. Galvin, meantime, has disappeared with six-month Sunday collections, which he uses to finance his nervous breakdown. He holes up in a hotel, hotel in El Monte and starts writing letters to the kids and the parents of the kids he molested in Stockton, Tulare, and Anselmo, confessing in detail to what he did. They weren't all altar boys. Galvin, it turns out, 
to be an equal opportunity predator. There were four girls. He apologizes and suggests that since he can't offer restitution, he would be willing to testify and admit his guilt in any civil suit the families wanted to bring. This one is crucial because the statute of limitations has run out for all these kids in the criminal courts. Estello swallowed his scotch and nodded at Cyril. You can guess the rest. These kids aren't kids anymore. Most of them are very fucked up adults and three of them are dead. One suicide, one a drug OD, one from AIDS. The letters arrive, the families go ballistic. Some go right to the local cops, which is how we get the news. But some of them go to their priests and that sets the really big wheels in motion. What seems to make the Cardinal really crazy is the girls. We've seen this over and over. They look the other way. Just a few queer priests to be expected. Doesn't really count. But you get priests who screw anything that moves. That makes them wind up the catapults. Cyril finished his second scotch and Costello signaled for more rounds. So the Archdiocesan bloodhounds tracked Galvin down in about two days. We don't know how. It took us nearly a week. He seemed to have talked him down off the ledge and renewed his commitment to the church. All we really know is that they bought him a first class one-way ticket to Dublin on Aer Lingus and an annuity which continues and is administrated by the archdiocese. We don't know any of the details. They don't want us to know. The stone wall went up immediately afterwards. So all I have is the word of friends in the local constabulary. Galvin now lives happily in Cork, enjoys the races I'm told, has applied for a teaching credential. Cyril accepted these last words like taps to his forehead, slightly recoiling, his eyes closed, his face now mottled. When he opened his eyes again, his voice was strained. Can he be extradited? Not with what we've got, Costello said. It's only the civil cases now, and Galvin has since recanted on the letters and apologized for his nervous breakdown. There were apparently some settlements for some of the families. We can only guess the ones that stopped talking to us. Galvin is a, good, is a done deal, and you need to forget him. The DA has to concentrate on the cases he has the chances of winning. There were over 600. Cyril blanched, 600? Did you think this was strictly local? Just the one guy? This was a whole lot of horny priests. Now it's a problem because now we can put a dollar number on what it's gonna cost the archdiocese. And if you wanna get the church's attention, all you need to do is present a bill. I found that out in a hurry. As soon as I started asking direct questions about Galvin to the good priest who raised me, I started getting calls from my superiors asking what the fuck I was doing, bothering the bishop. If they can reach me, imagine what they can do to you. Cyril suddenly realized that Costello was fairly drunk. Costello's focus and concentration in telling his tale had fooled Cyril. I should be ordering dinner, Costello said, but I'm not. Costello rubbed his nose and then looked hard at Cyril as though he were considering whether to go on. Two of those cases are from St. Vincent's, my parish, a priest I knew well, the McNally brothers, good friends of my son, Jim, great kids. I'd never understood why the light went out of them. Costello's broad hand gripped his forehead and his eyes squeezed shut. They opened again, wet reddened. I've stopped going to mass, 37 years, never missed a Sunday. This isn't the church I was raised in. Costello stood and fumbled for his wallet, lurched sideways and caught himself on a chair. The bartender looked up with alarm. Costello steadied himself and winked at Cyril. I leave it to you. Cyril watched Costello walk out the front door and then panicked. He couldn't remember how much cash he had on him. He did know that his only credit card was in the slit pocket of his cassock. The waitress approached. Would you like another drink? No, Cyril said. Can you tell me how much we owe? 
That's all taken care of, she nodded, the other gentleman. Cyril drove back to St. Patrick's. He was remembering the scratch and grab of the boys at the seminary, rough and tumble that could turn strange when you would look into the softening eye of the boy you'd pinned. But that was only friction. You took a shower, prayed, jacked off if you had to. Bitter the venial sin than the mortal. The natural feelings could be acknowledged, but not acted on. Cyril had come late to the seminary after a flourishing career as an amateur boxer. He hadn't been a virgin, far from it, but he knew many of his classmates were. His commitment had been one of discipline, the same discipline that had served him so well in the ring. It was the way to earn the education he craved, and he had succeeded, earning the bachelor's of trinity and two years of graduate school in Madrid. Years later in Los Angeles, he had been startled to see some of the meek boys of his seminary, confident and entitled, and he knew no longer virgins, swelled by their collars. He knew what would happen if he pursued his questioning on Father Galvin. The questions would double back, his obedience would come in doubt, and he would be looked upon as a troublemaker. It wasn't in him to question the church from the outside, but it wasn't possible from within and the damage had been done. It might be officially ignored, but the damage had been done. Those kids, to do that to those kids, no matter how fucked up they were, how weak, how willing to please. The famous passage came back to him, learned in the seminary. It had been a cautionary tale then, recited repeatedly, but never explained. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones who believe in me. It is better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and he were cast in the sea. No mention of a life jacket annuity. All were asleep at the rectory. Brother Cyril tugged off his slacks and sports shirt and drew on his cassock. Flashlight in hand, he unlocked the front door of the school and ascended the chairs to the fifth floor and unlocked the doors of the unconsecrated chapel. He closed the doors behind him and flicked the lights. He was startled by the brightness. Three powerful new overhead lamps had been installed, one on each side, slanting, and one directly above, highlighting and dramatizing the gleaming expanse of marble. He had been there the last day when the Miller brothers had concluded their work, a final cleaning with distilled water, and then the final polish with rouges, and then a sealant. What he remembered from that day was that neither Gerd nor Joachim wanted to leave. They found infinitesimal specks on the marble, surface to buff out, and then went over the surface the last time with printer's tack rags and a chamois cloth. Brother Malachi had to finally urge them out the door, reminding them that they would be back for the consecration, that they would participate in the consecration, cementing the altar stone over the remains of St. Priscilla. As the Miller brothers backed out the door, Cyril noted that they were leaving behind their canvas tool bags slumped in a corner and pointed this out. They said they would return for them, and it was clear that they wanted reasons to revisit their work. Gazing now at the altar, Cyril understood their reluctance to leave. It was a thing of beauty with an austere power. He unzipped the bags and sorted through them. He drew out his heavy sledgehammer a broad chisel and a claw hammer. All that week in his senior honors English section, he had been moving from the late 19th to the early 20th century po poets. And Cyril had noticed, noted and been slightly bemused by the number of stones and altars and marbles that there were in the poems. He thought the Miller brothers might have enjoyed the class. From Tawny's white Victorian sepulcher, that vain stone beautiful to the eye, which hides the, hides the vain corruption within. To Rilke's archaic torso of Apollo with his famous last line, you must change your life. Thrilling to senior boys, terrifying to a man of Cyril's age. Approaching the altar, Cyril lifted the sledgehammer, his right hand slid up the shaft and slid back to meet his gripping left hand 
as the hammer wheeled overhead and slammed down on the altar piece. The stone panel cracked into five pieces, separating in the classic star starburst pattern. Cyril broke up the five altar panels with five swings and used the claw handle, ha hammer and chisel to pry the pieces loose from the cement that bound them to the screen and plywood beneath. The fragments piled up around his feet as he hammered and pried, cracking in smaller pieces as they hit the pile. His head and hands and cassock were powdered with the white limestone dust. Sweat drew lines through his powdered face and neck as he hammered the lighter panels, encasing the tabernacle. They shattered and fell, and he clawed the last clinging fragments into the mound of rubble at his feet. In less than 10 minutes, the months of work by the Miller brothers and that of the workers of, in Carrara was gone. Panting, Cyril looked at his reflection in the gold tabernacle door. He tempered his fury. Malachi had paid for the door, not the cardinal. Cyril swung the door open and stowed the Miller brothers sledgehammer and broad chisel there. He left the chapel, lights blazing, marble dust hanging in the still air, and stalked down the stairway, the claw hang hammer swinging loosely in his left hand. He used his master key to open the door to Malachi's office. He sat in Malachi's chair, drew stationery from Malachi's desk drawer, and using Malachi's fountain pen, printed out a message. Jesus was a carpenter, and wood was good enough for him. He swept the desk pad to the floor, centered the paper on the desk, and then pegged it there with the claws of the hammer embedded deep in the wooden veneer. He left it there, left the lights on and the doors open, and walked to the rectory to wash his face and change to civilian clothing. Okay, um, this has been a, a delightful evening. Um, as some of you know, when I teach, uh, I begin and, and end my classes with a poem. And I have to explain to these fiction writers, some of whom have never been to a poetry reading, what the difference is. And as I tell them consistently, if you go to a really good poetry reading, you learn something, you acquire a kind of wisdom you can't acquire any other way. Um, and I think we had some of that tonight. Um, we do have, with the prosaic, we have at least an older pleasure, and that's the pleasure of the story. It takes you back inside the cave in front of the fire where somebody's telling you a story. Now we're done, and now you get to come and have some pizza. If you need any books signed, we'll be glad to do that. Um, there's some very nice uh, rosé, there's some very nice red wines, and a couple cookies. Quentin? All I have to say is another round of applause for Lee Matthews and Allison Turner both. Thank you all for coming. As you mentioned, we have some pizza and wine on the back patio. Please join us, hang out, buy some books, and just have a good time. Thanks so much. Thank you.